Hi, this is Ray Mossholder. What an honor to be reading a book by Dr. Billy Graham. What he meant in our last century was the greatest evangelist in the whole world. And we're getting to hear him. He's in heaven now. Can you imagine what he's going through? <laughs> what it waits for us to do as well. In fact, before long, I'm going to be reading Billy Graham's book on heaven. Nobody knew the Bible better than Billy Graham did. The Great Designer, Chapter 2 of The Journey. Our Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Psalm 8, 1. You'll never understand who you are until you understand who God is. The reason is simple. God made you. You and I aren't here by chance or by accident or because of some blind natural process. We're here because God put us here. That is an afterthought or a, on a whim, but by a deliberate act of creation. But how can we know what God is really like? After all, people have all kinds of ideas about God, some logical, some extremely fanciful, or even contradictory. Hey, do, how do we know which one is right, or if any of them are? Some years ago, I was invited to visit the Soviet Union's famed academic city, one of their finest scientific research centers located near and bore this name. I've seen it many times. I still have a hard time with it. Novobersk in Siberia. My daughter went there as a missionary. While there, I had a lively debate with one of the most distinguished scholars, the head of their anthropology department. As we talked, I asked him if he'd ever found a tribe or a group of people anywhere in the world that didn't believe in God or in some type of higher power. After a few minutes, he admitted he hadn't. Although he claimed to be an atheist, he reluctantly agreed that belief in a divine power is universal. Down inside, we all sense there must be something or someone greater than ourselves. We also sense that death must not be the end, but there must be something beyond the grave. Ecclesiastes 3, Ecclesiastes 3.11 makes it clear. The Bible says that God has also set eternity in the hearts of men. But what's God like? Some picture him as a kindly old grandfather with a long white beard and a big smile, kind of like the Mona Lisa, although a bit out of touch with these times. Others see him as a stern policeman, always ready to punish us if we get out of line. Still others include God must be like their own father might have been. 
indifferent or cold or never satisfied because we always fall short of what he demands. And some believe God's only a vague and personal force, you know, somewhat like gravity or magnetism. Or they conclude we can't know anything for certain about him. Your guess about God, they say, is just as good or as good or bad as mine. And some people, of course, reject the whole idea of God. Sometimes people ask me why I urge them to believe in Jesus Christ. Isn't that narrow, they say. Don't all religions believe essentially the same thing? Isn't one just as good as another? In reply, I point out how different the world's religions actually are from each other, something they often haven't realized. Some religions believe in one God, others believe in thousands of deities. Some believe God cares about us. Others contend God is indifferent to the human race. Some believe in life after death. Others don't. Some believe God is the limitless, sovereign ruler of the universe. Others worship man-made idols or animals or planets and the stars. And by the way, if you think this is right, if you think you're seeing me yawn, uh-huh. <laughs> Some believe God is gracious and loving, not, <laughs> by the way, not yawning at Billy Graham's writing. I just am starting to poop out <laughs> for this day. But I'll get the rest of the reading done for this evening. Some believe God cares about us, others contend God is indifferent to the human race. Some believe God is the limitless sovereign ruler of the universe. Others worship man-made idols or animals or planets and stars. Some believe God is gracious and loving. Others see him as harsh and judgmental. They can't all be right. Not if we live in a logical world, which we do. But are any of them right? How can we know? Unfortunately, most speculations about God miss one very important truth. God wants us to know what he's like. We don't need to guess because God has revealed himself to us. Suppose that you decided you didn't want anyone to know you existed. What would you have to do? Not only would you have to avoid any contact with any other people, but you'd have to be sure you didn't leave any evidence around that you existed. You couldn't even put out your trash or turn on a light. Just the smallest trace would indicate that you existed and the more clues you left behind, the more convinced people would be that you were real. Now this is some way, or somewhat, the way it is with God. We know he exists because he has left clues behind for us to discover. 
But there's a crucial difference. God isn't trying to hide from us. Quite the opposite, God wants us to know he exists. Not only that, he wants us to know what he's like. In other words, he wants to communicate with us. Just as we can only know someone if they reveal themselves to us. So we can only know God if he reveals himself to us, and he has. How has God revealed himself? One way is through the world around us, the world he created. His footprints are everywhere, if we'll but see them. Look up on a starry night, and you'll see the majesty and power of an infinite creator. Recently, I saw a report about some new discoveries in astronomy. It stated that astronomers now believe there may be as many as, watch this, 140 billion galaxies in the known universe. Some more than 11 billion light years away and each containing at least several hundred billion stars. We can't begin to imagine such distances or quantities. Or examine a drop of water through a powerful microscope and you'll see God's concern for even the smallest detail. Inspect a newborn baby's hands and feet, and you'll marvel at the intricacy of his design. Recently, I read an article pointing out that our bodies contain about 10,000 trillion cells each one containing a strand of our individual DNA, an unimaginable number. But think about the way that plants grow and rain falls and animals provide for their young and you'll see God's wisdom and care. Even when we look within ourselves we detect God's handiwork, our creativity, our inner sense of right and wrong, our ability to love and to reason, all bear witness to the fact that God created us in his image. The Bible says God has not less left himself without testimony. He's shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons. Acts 14, 17. The Bible also says, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made. Romans 1.20 Professor Charles Towns, who won the 2005 Templeton Prize and shared the 1964 Nobel Prize in Physics as co-inventor of the laser was recently quoted as saying, the face that the universe has a beginning is a very striking thing. How do you explain that unique event without God? No matter where we look, we see God's footprints. Simply looking around us isn't enough. We need something more if we're to see God clearly. We need him 
to speak to us. Now you might learn something about me if you saw me walking down the street. You would at least conclude I exist. <laughs> You'd learn even more by watching me work. But you'd only discover what it was really like if we sat down and talked. The same is true with God. We need him to speak to us, and he has. How has he spoken? Well, first of all, as we will see later in more detail, God has spoken to us, to us through a book, the Bible. This is why we call the Bible God's Word, because God gave it to us and he speaks to us through it. One biblical writer put it this way, God spoke through the prophets at many times and in various ways. Hebrews 1.1 1, 1. The Bible is actually a library of books some long, some short, written over hundreds of years by many authors. Behind each one, however, was another author, the Spirit of God. The Apostle Peter wrote, Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. God has spoken to us in words we can clearly understand. And those words are found in the Bible. Second, God has spoken to us through a person, Jesus Christ. Just as the Bible is God's written word, so Jesus, it's God's living word. Jesus was God in human flesh. And through him, we discover what God is really like. The Bible says, for in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. Colossians 2.9 Do you want to know what God's like? Look at Jesus Christ. For he was God living among us. Do you want to know what God is like? Well, John recorded it. God became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Glory as if the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John 1.14 We can know what God's like because he wants us to know. And we can know what God is like because he's spoken to us through the written word, the Bible, and through the living word, Jesus Christ. But what is he like? I'll always be grateful of my mother for making me memorize these words from our church's old catechism when I was a boy. God is the spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in his being. Wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. Now, I can't say that I fully understood those words then, and even now I marvel at their depth. But over the years, they've given me rich understanding 
of who God is and what he's like. Admittedly, we can't fully understand God. He's far greater than we are. He's infinite and we are finite. Only in heaven will we see him in all of his fullness. Sometimes when I was a boy, my father would drive us from our home near Charlotte, North Carolina, to the Blue Ridge Mountains. I remember seeing them through the haze in the distance. And when they first appeared, they seemed so small. But we seemed so big in our automobile. But as we got closer to the mountains, they became huge and we became small. The same is true with God. Sometimes we think God must be just like we are, only a little bit bigger. But that is an inaccurate picture at all. He's God and we are human. God reminded the ancient Israelites, I am God and not man, the Holy One among you. Hosea 11.9 Only when we understand his greatness will we understand our smallness. But this doesn't mean we can't understand anything about God. We can know what he's like because God has revealed himself to us. Let me summarize four important truths he wants us to understand. First, God is a spirit. The first truth God wants you to know about himself is that he is a spirit. God is a spirit. Jesus told the Samaritan woman that he met outside the village of Sychar in John 4, 24. God isn't made of atoms or molecules. He isn't part of the created world. He exists instead in a wholly different realm, the realm of the spirit. What do you think when you hear the word spirit? Do you imagine some kind of wispy, ethereal drifting around like fog? Or do frightening images come to mind, such as you might see at Halloween or in a scary film? But those miss the mark because spirit is the opposite of material. Jesus said that a spirit does not have flesh and bones. Luke 24, 39. Because he is a spirit, God isn't limited by time or space. He can be everywhere at once. He's in the midst of the largest galaxy and the smallest atom. He's far greater than the material world, which is one reason we aren't to worship idols or nature. Because he's a spirit, he's not limited in any way. If you've been trying to limit God, don't. Don't try to confine him to one place or paint an imaginary picture of him in your mind or restrict him to one way of doing things. Don't put limits on his power or greatness or love or wisdom. Limiting God is like looking at a mud puddle and thinking it's an ocean. Second, God is a person. 
Not only has God a spirit, he's also a person. That is, he has a personality, just as we do. Every trait we attribute to ourselves can be attributed to God. A person feels, thinks, desires, and decides, and so does God. A person enters into relationships, and so does God. A person acts, and so does God. God feels, God thinks, God sympathizes, God forgives, God hopes, God decides, God acts, God judges, all because he's a person. If he weren't, why pray to him or worship him? God is an impersonal force or power. He's a person. He's the most perfect person imaginable. There is, of course, a vast difference between God's personality and ours. He is perfect and we aren't. Emotions like anger, selfishness, hatred, jealousy, and pride overwhelm us. Our personalities even become sick or self-destructive. But God isn't this way. He alone is perfect. Even his anger is righteous because it's directed solely against evil. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 32.4, his works are perfect, and all his ways are just. Third, God is holy. Not only is God a spirit and a person, but he's also holy and righteous and pure. Bible says in Habakkuk 1.13, your eyes are too pure to look on the evil. You can't tolerate wrong. Remember, this is right. Remember when God couldn't even look at Jesus on the cross because of the evil there that they put him through and the sins of the whole world, past, present, and future, smashed on him. God couldn't look. Admittedly, we have a hard time understanding this. We're weak. We're imperfect. And we can scarcely grasp the overwhelming perfection and holiness of God. We have become so used to sin that we can't imagine anyone being absolutely perfect, but God is. Bible says in 1 John 1, 5, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Because God is holy, he never does wrong, ever, ever, ever. Occasionally, we hear of someone who is exceptionally good and self-sacrificing. But even then, we know they're not perfect. If we think we're perfect, it just proves we aren't. Only God is perfect and holy. From one end of the Bible to the other, God reveals himself as absolutely pure, without flaw or blemish of any kind. When Isaiah glimpsed the vision of God, he was overwhelmed by God's holiness and his own sinfulness. He saw angels surrounding God's throne, 
calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Isaiah 6, 3. In John's vision of heaven, he saw the same truth. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Revelation 4, 8. Only when we understand the holiness of God will we understand the depth of our sin. God is holy and we aren't. Because of that, a great chasm has opened up between us and God. We stand guilty and condemned before him, worthy only of his judgment and condemnation. Apart from Christ, we have no hope of heaven. Because even one sin contaminates us and makes us unfit to come into God's presence. From time to time, I've visited leper colonies and tuberculosis hospitals in various parts of the world, and I have never been allowed to come close to those who are sick unless I was wearing special protective clothing this is someone with a contagious disease may be cut off from human contact. So the disease of sin cuts us off from God's holy presence. Don't take the holiness of God lightly, for it's the very essence of his character. Finally, God is love. If God were only holy, however, we would have no hope of heaven when we die and no hope of his blessing right now. But listen, God isn't only a spirit and a person who is holy and righteous. God is also love. And this makes all the difference. The Bible says, God is love, 1 John 4, 8. And just as his holiness is perfect, so is his love. The more I read the Bible, the more I realize that love is God's supreme attribute. Behind every dealing God has with us, is his perfect love. It was love that made him create us. And it was love that caused him to send his son to redeem us. His love pursues us and draws us to himself. And his love will someday take us into his presence forever. First John 4.10 this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and set his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. As with other aspects of his nature, we have a difficult time fully understanding God's love. For one thing, the word love has become to mean almost anything today. We say we love ice cream or the color of a car. Or we say we love an entertainer or a celebrity, although we've never met them and never will. But God's love is far deeper than this. His love is not a passing fancy or a superficial emotion. It's a profound and unshakable commitment that seeks what's best for us. Human love may change or fade, 
God's love never will. He says to us in Jeremiah 31, 3, I've loved you with an everlasting love. I've drawn you with loving kindness. Now, don't sentimentalize God's love. God's love isn't a warm, fuzzy feeling that ignores sin or shuns judgment. God's holiness demands that sin be punished. But God's love has provided the way of redemption through Christ. If it weren't for God's love, we'd have no hope either in this life or in the life to come. But there is hope because he loves us. He loves you. Do you love him? Would you like to know him? If you haven't received Christ, I hear this, this song, just as I am without one plea. That's why that was a song sung always at the Crusades that Billy Graham held all over the world. There is hope for you because I don't care what kind of a sinner you are. God says, I don't care either. Just come to me and I'll clean you up. If I fell in a mud puddle as a child, my mom or dad would be quick to pick me up out of that mud puddle and make sure I get a bath. For the blood of Christ cleanses from all sin. Come to him. How? To say out loud, Jesus, I want you. I want you to come in here to my life. I want you to save me. I want you to wash away my sins. And he will. Your sins past, present, and future. Now, because I said that, don't say, oh, good. I get to sin in the future. You don't get to. You will sin in the future. And Jesus will forgive you. But in Jesus' name, don't be that silly or that stupid. Instead, give your life to Jesus forever. King of all glory, he weaves our life story. And we're, we're still here with nothing to fear because he's so near. Chapter 3 tomorrow, The Great Design. Now, does that sound like the same book I'm reading of 20 infallible evidences that God exists? Because I'm reading it at the same time as this. And the chapter 3 is The Great Design. Is this just saying that no, it's not? You know what underlining is? In my Bible, when I find a verse that just, wow, comes out at me, I underline it. Now, God underlines his great design. And as one person tells you about it, another will be able to really focus on it too from a different perspective. Don't miss tomorrow. Abraham was called the friend of God. James 2, 23. He's your friend. You be his friend too.